bonding with stress today, actually. <laughs> so I've got a question for you. If you could, right now, the press of a button, no strings attached, remove all stress from your life. Who would take up that offer? Ah, <laughs> interesting. Well, I'm a PhD candidate at the Wicking Dementia Research and Education Centre here in Hobart, and I do study, amongst other things, stress. And it's my job here to tell you today that taking up that offer would be a fatal error. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, stress becomes problematic when it's chronic. That means that the things that are causing us stress, called stresses, have gone unresolved for a long time. Research tells us that chronic stress underpins lower well-being, lower life satisfaction, it may underpin and exacerbate illnesses, and is also, recently discovered, a significant contributor to the onset of Alzheimer's disease and dementias. So why wouldn't you want to press that button? So the idea for this talk came up after I was doing a science meet and greet at the, uh, the TMAG here in Hobart, and I had my hair frizzed up, I was wearing a lab coat, which I don't usually wear, and uh, I had a big <laughs> button there um, that said Trauma Buster. It was pretty bold. <laughs> if you're not ready to have some quite intense and personal conversations with people you've never seen in your life, um, there are probably better things you can do. But I was very glad for the conversations. You know, I felt um, quite privileged to be led into people's um, histories of trauma and things like that, experiences in their families. It was really nice. But the thing that perplexed me the most was not a conversation about trauma, it was about stress. A lady had been sort of waiting in the wings, like, you know, you stand around and you have a chat, just sort of loiter about awkwardly until someone chats to you, and then you nervously explore that for a bit. So she came up to me and she said, ah, stress? I said, ah, oh, no, I never get stressed. Well, that's pretty cool. What's your secret? <laughs> I, mean, I could do a thesis on this. I said, ah, oh, it's easy. You know, any time I start to get stressed or there's a situation where I'm stressed, I just go, nah, I'm not dealing with that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> she had grandchildren. Um, I have no idea how she got anything done with them at all. But she was interested to chat, so, you know, we kept having a conversation, much like the one I'm having with you today, um, except it's easier, really. You don't have to politely wait for someone to finish talking, that kind of thing. It's much more simple. <laughs> thank you. I will wait for you to finish laughing, though. Thank you. I lo love that. Um, <laughs> after that, after we had this chat, she said, ah, oh, so I should do things, even though they stress me out. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you really, really, really should. And it got me thinking, you know, how many people go about their lives avoiding situations because they might, might be stressful? How long had she been doing this? I don't know. I wish I'd asked her at the time. It would have been great for this chat. So I did what all good researchers do when they have an important question in mind. I dove deep into the archives of Google. And after I searched <laughs> how to live stress-free, um, I didn't even bother the question mark in this one of those days. In less than half a second, there were 100 million results from hyperlinks, how to live stress-free, living your best stress-free life, 10 tips for your dog to be stress-free. They'd had everything. It was really, really interesting. But the thing that stood out to me the most was not that these things, well, they, they didn't have anything in common in terms of living stress-free. What they did tell us to do teach us to do. They had tips and tricks for living well with stress. All of these things that you hear to be stress-free, you know, walking on the beach, you know, there's all these inspirational YouTube videos of yogis and sunsets and, you know, name it. Um, they will tell you that they're teaching you how to be stress-free and that's the ideal lifestyle, but there's no such thing. That's because everything we do generates stress. 
Our muscles move, our hearts beat, our brains fire. That generates stress. Jokes are only funny because you get led down the garden path until left of center is a punchline that surprises us. And if it's a good joke, <laughs> you feel so uncomfortable, you've got to get it out somehow. That's stress. You let it out and you feel better after laughing, not because you've returned to zero stress, but because you've returned back to your comfortable, nice, familiar level of it. That's called homeostasis. Now, stress is a potent performance enhancer. And I'm angry at the wellness culture, and I'm angry at the Insta Instagram influencers because they have contributed to the character assassination of stress. It's true. It's true. One of the people who was responsible for popularizing the term stress, there were many, it's a researcher who's Hungarian-Canadian called Hans Selye. There's a fantastic quote, it was one of the first ones that my supervisor gave me when I started my project a couple of years ago. And it's this, Selye says, complete freedom from stress is death. We must not, and indeed cannot, avoid it. Rather, we can meet it efficiently, enjoy learning about its mechanism, and adjust our life philosophy accordingly. It's pretty sick, isn't it? We're all going to be stress-free eventually. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do much to get there, and you probably won't have much choice in the matter when it comes. That's great, isn't it? It'll probably take a load off your mind. <laughs> who, was, uh, who was raising their hand earlier, please? <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> but, I mean, it's a great quote, it's eloquent, it's, it's beautiful, it's lovely, all of that, but there's just words, you know. They represent some ideas, so explore those ideas. You know, how do we use this? How do we use it to our advantage? Where's the life hack? I'm going to be lodging one of these hyperlinks soon. So I broke it down, and actually, interestingly, when I was doing that in preparation for today, I found that there were three key components to Celia's words that are also um, common underpinnings of uh, some of the best tools that psychologists have available to them. Most useful anyway, some of them. So the first one is learning about stress's mechanism. What is it? This, for, if you're looking for a psychological term or something similar, is called psychoeducation. You can't attack what you don't know. You can't use something if you don't know what it is or what it's doing to you. So the first step is really to learn what it is. What is stress? Hopefully. This chat here today will, <laughs> will help a little bit there, if I've done my job right. The second one is, once you know what stress is, then you can start to change your mind about it. You can change your life philosophy. This is cognitive reframing, cognitive restructuring, literally changing your mind. Is stress something that's, you know, something that's concerning? Is it scary? Is that energy that's coursing through your body, is that nerves? Or is that you just getting ready to go? Is your brain firing at 100 miles an hour because you're anxious, or have you just not given it a point of focus yet? You can use stress. You know what it is, you know what it's doing to you. You can change your mind about it. Once you change your mind about it, then you can start to meet it efficiently. That means stress without the stress. How often is it when you start getting stressed, you go, oh my god, I'm so stressed. You're adding layers of stress on top of the thing, it's ridiculous. That's not efficient. Once you know what it is, once you've changed your mind about stress and perhaps seeing it as the potent performance enhancer that it is, you'll realise that you're charged and ready to go. You won't worry about that. That's a great feeling. I can tell you, giving a TEDx talk is extremely stressful. I um, was sitting here watching these wonderful talkers uh, you know, this afternoon, thinking, oh, God, they've done such a good job. Oh, my God, oh, my God. But, um, you know, you can get hyped with it. That's actually excitement. You know, um, this, is, this is great fun, it's terrifying, but it's awesome. It's a bit of cognitive reframing. You know, also, interestingly, watching TEDx talks is also stressful, but stressful enough to hold your attention for long enough. Novelty is stressful. It directs our attention. So now that we know a little bit about what stress is, 
What do we do with it? How do we use it? So the way that we deal with these stresses, remember, stresses that go unresolved for a long time become chronic and they can make us sick. So how do we go about dealing with stresses? These are coping strategies. I looked at some of the literature before coming up today and there were three key coping strategies that make us feel great. They're fantastic, they're awesome, they're super, super effective. They're easy to do. But they really undermine our efforts. These are called maladaptive or avoidant coping styles. So a stressor comes up, right? A stress is a motivator. You know, physiologically, if you're hungry, you get food. That's stress. If you're thirsty, you take a drink. If you're, if you're cold, you put on a jacket. If you're hot, you take some clothes off, go to the beach. These are stresses uh, driving our behaviours. Psychologically, if we want to get something, anything done in life, achieving goals, going to work, literally getting out of bed in the morning, we need stress to drive that. And so what happens when we start cheating? We start finding these coping strategies that drop our stress below that action threshold. Oh, we get pretty comfy, that's pretty nice, but it doesn't help us. So the first one is substance use. Having a drink, three, ten, when you're stressed, you know, you'll really you'll feel great if you can remember what it is you're feeling great about, but it drops us down, we don't act. The second one is social, social support. This isn't asking your friend how to deal with your problem. This is going to your friend telling you them you've got a problem and them telling you that you'll feel better. It's fine, don't worry about it, and you don't. And again, you drop down your stress, you do nothing. It hasn't gone anywhere. The last one is called behavioural disengagement. And that's doing something, anything. You know, I'm, I'm classic for this, I'm doing, doing a TED talk instead of my uh, thesis right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Duncan. <laughs> Anything that isn't what you should be doing. Um, you know, and that, that includes, you know, burying your head in the sand, you know, making your house really, really tidy. When I, when I had exams, my house was like, was, you know, spot on. I felt great, but I wasn't dealing with the stressor. And, you know, you cop chronic stress as a student. And so, I guess, although these are very effective coping strategies, they're super effective. They will undermine anything that you want to be achieving in life. If you've got dreams that you want to pursue, engaging in these as a habit, it's okay for winding down, but as a habit of coping with that stress that should be motivating you and pushing you, that will kill those dreams. If you think about yourself in the future and you've got a particular view of who and what you would like to be, engaging in these strategies will sink that. It's that simple. And so, okay, well, you know, what do we do about that? That's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> I feel like a drink now. Um, so there are effective coping strategies. There are adaptive copers. Research tells us that people who cope in an adaptive manner, a proactive manner, have higher quality of life. They have better well-being. And if they are not experiencing that chronic stress, they're going to be better for longer they're going to have a higher life satisfaction and they are going to drop their risk, quite literally, of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So what do they do? Well, they just do it. They just do the thing. <laughs> so be curious, go out and do the thing. <laughs> so it's not that simple, right? Like, you know, if you're stressed about something, clearly there's a few blocks there. Probably there's a bit of work to do there. And so what I am asking you to do is, yeah, be curious about it. If you can start coping adaptively, you can start doing the things that you want to do. And that doesn't mean, you know, tomorrow, if you've got troubles with confrontation, I'm not telling you to go to work in a couple of days from now and tell your boss to go jump. That's going to cause you chronic stress. You don't want that. Then you've got some unresolved personality crisis, all these things that come with it. What I'm saying is that you should start small, low stakes. Find a friend you really trust, someone who's a really good listener, and have a chat with them, and tell them to go and jump. And then find the next person up from that, maybe the lady at the shop, the postman, 
go jump. And I promise you, no, probably not like this, but what I'm saying is that by starting low stakes, it's just like working your muscles at the gym. You start low, you get better at it. You get better at it, you feel better. You feel good. You feel good, you'll be more willing to go at the things. The more willing you are to do the thing, the more things that you do, the more skills that you get. The more skills that you get, the more able you will be to deal with that kind of stressor when it comes up, and it will. It's by starting small and being curious about our stress that we can start to make a difference for our lives. We can start doing the things that we want to do, and we can nail it. That saying, you know, if you want something done, get a busy person to do it, they just know that leaving things is a, is a pain in the butt. You know, they, they come back around, they linger, they sit there, you know, that's, that's not great. They know that just by getting it done, by ticking it off, they can finally relax. They start to feel better as soon as they begin to address the problem. That gives them a little hit of dopamine, carrot on a stick, they're doing it. And they keep doing it because it makes them feel great. Doing the thing. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty great TEDx talk, isn't it? <laughs> it's a great talk. Let's go out there and do the thing. But actually, addressing it. If you're curious about it, why does this make me stressed? Am I just excited about it? Why am I stressed about it in the first place? Is it my lack of exposure to this thing? Do I need to build up some more experience? Is it a lack of skills? Do you need to ask a friend? No, no, don't tell them to pat you on the back. Tell them to teach you how to use PowerPoint. You know, starting small, building the skills. By addressing your stress, you can make friends with it. And when you start to realise, you start to feel that stress, rather than going to your usual, if you're a maladaptive or avoidant coper, rather than going to your usual habits, use it to drive you, use it to motivate you. You've just sat down on the couch, oh, the clothes need doing... <sighs> All right, fine, I'll do it. You know, you're starting to tick off jobs straight away. You're building good habits into your life. So if there's one thing I'd like you to take away from this talk, is that you can be friends with stress. Don't keep, don't keep trying to be stress-free for, for the sake of your better selves. Don't buy into it. Thanks.